Um, so I was asked, and thank you for Henry and Chris and Nancy asking me to do this, um, to talk a little bit about um, the opportunities that El Nino provides. And so um, I'm going to do a little bit of successes, failures, and the value of just doing. And I hope that this, by the end of it, you have some idea of what's happened, what got started here in the Pacific, and um, how far we've come, and hopefully inspired to take whatever next steps you think most appropriate um, together from here at this workshop. So um, El Nino as an opportunity. So I, I have had this slide for quite a while. I don't even remember where I got it. But I don't know if you, if you can read it. But it says, it's got a bunch of math equations. And it says, then a miracle occurs and other stuff happens, right? So I think the miracle is you guys in the room. The people that you put together in the right combination with the right structure actually make stuff happen. And you can have the best math and the best science in the world, as we discussed yesterday. Unless you have the right people in the room and the right combination, nothing's going to come, come of it. So if you get nothing else out of that, know that we understand that. And hopefully, we're, we're trying to figure out how to make it happen in a sustainable way. So I'm going to do just a little bit of history on El Nino and some of the activities, a little bit of institutional design, the value of a lasting impact of a handful of dedicated and sometimes very tired individuals, some of whom are in this room and have been at this for a while. And I know that they're very tired because they've been at it for a while. Um, the value of fostering ongoing change and how to do that. So we talked yesterday about these great frameworks and the conversations you've been having here and how to actually use them to do something, move, move forward, um, and just taking action and how we might think about um, collaborating to do that. So I want you to just step back 20 years. Um, we heard a lot of information yesterday about the ability to predict climate patterns and El Nino just now about El Nino and drought. Um, back in the early 80s and 90s, that's 30 years ago, um, El Nino and the seasonal predictions were just evolving, but very rapidly. It was a big focus of the climate community. There was a big push in parts of the federal government, including the part where I was in the climate program, called something else at the time, to understand what information was needed, how we're going to use the seasonal information, what kind of information we should actually be producing so that people would use it, because we did not want to be in the position of just creating information and throwing it out there and going, OK, well, we put it on the website. We gave it to you. Now go use it. We wanted much more robust and cohesive dialogue about the information that was coming out of this whole new field of science. And at that time, only a few non-climate scientists understood the concept and the difference between climate variability and change. It was just climate, climate change, global warming, all this stuff. So the terminology, I mean, that was, we've come a long way, even if you just stop at that slide. But Fast forward a little bit to 1996. The prediction tools were there. The predictions were available. In fact, uh, we were just talking about a couple of folks who were doing El Nino predictions at the time, scientists who were making the scientists quite comfortably in the lab. But it was quite hard to get them to put the forecast out because there was a risk to them involved, their science reputation. What if they were wrong, right? We didn't want anybody to act on it. We just wanted to talk about people acting on it, right? If they actually did it, ah, that was really scary. So we had to figure out how to get that how overcome that hurdle. El Nino was not even a household name. Most people didn't know. Now, in the Pacific, pretty sure you did. And in the coastal Peru, there are countries who had a long history with El Nino, but globally, it did not have the, the name that it, that it did. Um, getting the three-month, six-month lead time forecast out the door was really challenging for science reasons as well as for you know, scientific scientist management reasons. People were just a little bit reluctant to put that kind of forecast out. It was very new. And the other part of that is with water, with drought, with agriculture, the impact was a little bit more direct. People kind of understood that El Nino meant more rainfall, less rainfall temperatures. We understood the teleconnections at the time a little bit. But what did that mean for health? So with the heat wave, it was a little more clear. But when it came to understanding rainfall and impact on infectious disease, you know, what did that mean? Because there are so many other factors that affect the health outcome. And the other thing you had going for you here was that you had already started the Pacific Enso Application Center based here in Hawaii, working in the uh, broader Pacific region for El Nino and El Nino science-related activities. I think some of you might even know and have worked with Chip Gard, who I think is still there, and Mark Lander over in Guam. So they and the folks here in Hawaii were pretty much comprised the Pacific Enso Application Center. All right, so it was 96. The forecast was, OK, there's an El Nino coming. Now, this is where just the confluence event sort of just happens. Um, 
In 96, there was a colloquium sponsored by the American Society for Microbiology on climate variability in human health, an interdisciplinary perspective, and it was taking place in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Roger, so you'll, you know, some of the people that you're working with now were at the time. Um, Nancy and Chris were there. Several other scientists were in the room. A few public health type folks, mostly CDC types, were in the room. And we actually got the forecast that day while we were all down there. And I know it's probably really thwarted to be happy that there's an El Nino coming. Cool, there's an El Nino coming. We're all excited. And they're like, okay, we really shouldn't be excited because that means, you know, disaster and mayhem. But the forecast was out. We were, so it was this conflicted thing. Um, and we decided that the people in the room had been trying to figure out what this climate variability thing was, what to do with this forecast. And basically what happened is we had the scientists in the room decided that they wanted to take advantage of this forecast opportunity to just figure out what that meant for health. Let's just dive in and do it. So they agreed that they wanted to do something now. It was about 25 researchers. We started out with a few more. Everybody in the room signed up. There was a long, longer process for sort of engaging folks. And in the end, it was about 25 of 35 people who'd originally signed up. They agreed to just add to their existing workload. They were already funded by NIH, by CDC, by some other country, by the SPREP, by the WHO. And they agreed to add this additional layer to their existing work to try and understand the impact of the upcoming El Nino on health, improve the quality of the science, because also at the time, there was a lot of controversy over how much science is behind this? Is it just hand waving? We're just, just draw, drawing correlations in the sky, you know? And uh, so we really needed to improve the quality of the science. And we wanted to do it to inform the public health community. So those were the goals. This is basically what it looked like. So you have an ENSO teleconnection map at the time. I had to dig this out. This <laughs> is an old slide. <laughs> um, Chris is not, it's an old, I, I had to work to find this one. Thank you very much. Um, and you'll see here in the Pacific the focus with waterborne um, disease and dengue. Not that those were the only problems you had, but those were the people at the table and their expertise. And we had scientists around the world who were working on these various issues over a long period of time. Well, about two years, actually. Great, we've got all these people together. Let's go do this. It seems really clear. We're going to monitor the effects. We're going to do something about it. We're going to manage public health risks. Great. We're all on the same page. And I like pulled people together this first meeting in DC, and I was young and naive and super enthusiastic, right? Chris, you'll know this slide. The biggest problem with communication is the illusion it has taken place. Do you see all the different ideas that people have here? Right? It was very much like that. Everybody was very excited, and we were all going off in the same direction, except it wasn't the same direction. I knew better. I had a little bit of a degree in institutional design, and I really did know better. But, you know, this is exciting. And so everybody was still very patient. We worked together. The first thing we did was, all right, what do you actually need? If you're, gonna, if you're managing health risks in uh, Kenya or Marshall Islands, actually, um, what do you need? What do you need? So I got a group of people together. I had some of the really best health people, some of the really good climate people. I believe Roger was even there, Tom Carl. And it was just a very nice, like, high-level group of people. And I thought, all right, now we're really going to get somewhere. And so they were sitting around the table, and we were going to deploy into the field for the El Nino. So you're going to go study topic issue wherever you are, dengue, cholera, Rift Valley fever, waterborne disease. What do you need? What kind of climate information? What sort of instrumentation do you need? What do you need? What kind of forecast? What kind of people? And it was a room about this size. And that's what we got. <laughs> um, I don't know. What do you have? Well, I don't know. What do you need? Well, I don't know. What do you have? Well, we need rainfall data. OK, well, how much rainfall data? Well, I don't know. What do you have? What do you mean by rainfall data? Do you mean daily data? Do you mean <laughs> hourly data? Do you mean a time series data? Well, I don't know. What's a time series? Really? deer in the headlights. So um, Chris and Nancy are both nodding because they were there. And um, I don't think anybody, Roger, I'm not sure you were there. But I'm sure you've all had a similar experience. I in the headlights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, you were. So nobody, nobody failed, though. We, we still kept going. We decided we would just keep going. We gave people, and there are a few little stories. If I have time, I'll tell you along the way. But, but it really was um, 
everybody was super enthusiastic. Everybody really wanted to do it. And we figured out how to do it anyway, despite some of these challenges very early on. And it was a compressed time frame because we had this moment. We couldn't just spend a year trying to figure out what each other meant. We had to like figure out some way of communicating and making something happen. We tracked media coverage, and we also did a, a series of targeted um, regional you know, outbreaks that we expected, and we tried to support them, and we tried to do some um, regional events. We linked to the Climate Outlook Forums and a few other meetings around the world, so there's a lot of activity that happened with, with and surrounding the ENSO experiment. The forecasters hit the road. I put this up here specifically because the part of this you'll see um, at the end, it's not on this slide, but it, it has a lot to do with trust. And some of the programs that have evolved since then, like the RISA programs and the BRACE programs, are about building those long-term collaborations on the ground to understand the nature of the problem. So when the forecasters hit the road, Chip Guard was coming to Pompeii, and I'll tell you that story in just a second, um, because he has a story about trust, okay? So he's coming to Pompeii for this El Nino event. And we're doing all these regular coordination calls, hands-on training, um, building the partnerships. In the Pacific, the first ENSO meeting was in Fiji, uh, the ENSO experiment meeting was in Fiji in 97. And then that launched a series, it helped launch, not solely launched, a series of health and small, climate and health in small island states led by WHO, WMO, and UNEP in the subsequent years. And at the end of the experiment, we did a synthesis of the next steps, um, types and approach to research, and um, how we might go about engaging public health, ecology, climate, the different communities in a more sustained fashion. So there was a, a bit of a structure to this program that we developed a little bit on the fly. And the piece that I wanted to talk about was when you're, when you're putting a forecast out. So on the forecasters hit the road part, not quite yet. Um, Part of, the, part of the challenge is taking an El Nino forecast that says you're going to have more rainfall than normal without a level of specificity and trying to figure out from a public health perspective what that actually means and who's going to use that information. So a lot of what we did initially in trying to track the impact of El Nino, yes, we did the, the newspaper reports and people did some studies and they, they did what they could, but a lot of it was actually just defining the problem, understanding what actually the, the health questions were, what folks actually needed to be able to make a decision differently, um, and building those partnerships. Implement to action in learning mode. So you did that through this process. It was non-threatening. It, it was an experiment, right, an ENSO experiment. You can do it. You can mess up. You can fail. That's kind of the nature. Actually, failure is good. It might help you propel you faster. And it's a safe environment to do that. So the risk factor for those making decisions, you could do it in a conceptual framework and not actually have to take the risk. You could even run it through a scenario and, and see what would happen, but you didn't actually have to make a decision with it um, at that point. The key was institutionalizing that learning and feedback, and then using that to determine and do the research, the data collection, improve understanding the problem, and then evaluate and drive the research. So you'll see the cycle come back. We did this to start understanding the problem, defining the research needs, developing the products, evaluating, and leading back into the research and action piece. That last part there, it's all about building trust, though. Um, to begin with, you do have to get to know each other and each other's language. And I'm not telling anybody in this room something you don't already know. Everybody here is here, I'm sure, because they do that in their own way. So this slide is the first example of really where um, in the whole ENSO experiment, I think the first case where a forecaster really took a risk and went out, and it was Chip Guard, and it was through the Pacific ENSO Application Center, and this was in Pompeii. And he tells the story. I was not there but of yelling over the rain, hitting the tin roof in the government building, saying, it's going to be a drought in six months, I promise. Well, not I promise, but he was yelling over the rain. And they trusted him enough. And I, we, I talked to some of the folks from Pompeii. I don't know that you were there at the time. We might have missed by a couple of years. But they trusted enough to set up the El Nino task force. And you all can tell me much more about this than I, than I, I have only heard. But my understanding is that there was a jingle that was a highly requested song, and it was a big social media effort to try and get people to boil water. And in fact, there was a reduction of diarrheal disease in that year. So it was a very effective thing. But it was because there was a trust in the forecaster, not just the forecast. OK. Now, I'm going to talk a couple of examples and then a few, um, a few systems that, that if we have time, we can talk about later. I just want to put them in front of you. 
I know you don't have Rift Valley fever here. Rift Valley fever is a mosquito-borne disease. It's uh, transmitted by a mosquito to livestock, and it affects mostly livestock, and then humans get in the way. And it has economic and um, social impacts as well as health impacts. But I'm using it because this was one of the case studies in the ENSO experiment. And they did have a severe outbreak, or they were worried about a severe outbreak in Kenya in the 97, 98, because there were some hypotheses, some well-formed hypotheses about the nature of rainfall and the spread of Rift Valley fever. So we sent a CDC folks, where's our CDC colleague? Okay, so yeah, so don't take this personally because it's a funny story. Um, we sent our CDC colleagues in this, like, what do you need when you're gonna go you're going to go do investigate this outbreak. You're going to try to get ahead of the curve. What do you need? So they have these instruments called hobos. They're basically big weather instruments. I don't even know if they have them anymore, but there's some new version. And they're like, great. Well, we're going to go do our you know, blood tests of animals and humans. And they took the, uh, the hobos with them. And we got a whole lot of environmental data back. They did a good job of using those hobos. They took rainfall and temperature and humidity and land use and land cover in a great spreadsheet over here. And they had their IGM, IgG data, the livestock data over here. Geographical data over here, health data over here. Do you see the problem? <laughs> so it took about a year for some part of the federal government to figure out how to co-locate those data so we could actually do something. Now they thought it was great, they were excited, but we, it was something as simple as just taking the data measurements in the right way so that we could actually co-locate, geolocate the physical data with the health data and then be able to do the analysis afterwards. That's my point. So it's simple lessons like that. Action informs research, informs information and services that are delivered, which should inform action, which should inform research and information and services. You're getting the picture here. So. All right, um, I'm going to go through the next part a little bit since I already have uh, five minutes left. But I wanted to pause for a second and let you know that part of what that ENSO experiment got started, part of the reason the ENSO experiment got started was because of the capacity we had at the Pacific ENSO Center and some of the work that was already going on and the interest we had in the Pacific Islands. The projects were around the world. It got started through a much glo global network. But one of the things that we set out to do was use the information and understand better what the nature of the problem was and what the research demands were. Well, it was pretty clear what some of the research demands were. And so some of us then set up this uh, research program, a joint research program between NOAA, NASA, EPA, NSF, and the Electric Power Research Institute. Chris Ebi was there at the time. And it led, so my point is not to go into a history of that research program, but it did actually help identify some research gaps. This was, um, about one and a half to two million bucks four or five years in a row. We pooled money. We required climate ecology modelers to be on the team and public health folks to be on the team. So we began to change the nature of how this work was funded. And we did that based on what we learned from the ENSO experiment and the gaps that we felt confident funding, right? It's a small subset of the window there. Um, this is just a list of the research that was funded through um, not all of it was evolved through the um, ENSO experiment. It was a peer-reviewed competitive research program. So um, some of them had their starts in the ENSO experiment and some of, the, some of them did not. So I'm going to go back to the Rift Valley Fever thing because I want you to see how it got started by just doing. And it even had some problems along the way. But now, after years, they've gotten some additional funding from NASA and I think NIH as well. There is actually an operational website that puts out a forecast of Rift Valley fever. And just a couple years ago, several of the US agencies began to put the whole system together, the forecast with what you could do about it and, the, and with enough lead time to take some action. We're not great at this, this operational part yet. Um, there are some issues with that. But the fact is, after time, there is actually an operational product. It's on the WHO website. And people who are concerned about Rift Valley fever, I understand, do use it. So, we know a lot more about infectious disease in El Nino now. Many of you know this. You're working on some of these issues already. You even do a better job and a much greater resolution in the Pacific than this. Point is, we understand a lot more about the effects of El Nino, the rainfall temperature, the hurricane patterns, the typhoon patterns, um, some of the things that are even some of the drought issues we just heard about. We can use the information to build prediction tools that public health folks can and do and want to use. We've done this for Vibrio. This I'll use the cholera example because that's the one that's most relevant. But we know that the 
the primary drivers for coastal cholera are sea surface temperature and salinity and chlorophyll. And there are other drivers. So just the environmental drivers alone obviously don't mean that there's going to be a de disease outbreak of any, any sort. It means there are environmental drivers that increase your risk of an outbreak or increase your risk of some sort of health outcome. And so we're using those kinds of drivers to do projections, long-term projections. This is a Vibrio projection for um, Alaska on the left. And this is an operational product for Vibrio in the Chesapeake Bay. So it goes all the way from two days being used by our Food and Drug Administration and by the coastal fishers in Maryland um, to long-term projections. So the information that started through some of these more ad hoc kinds of things um, actually has had a life and is evolving into being an operational product on its own. Now, that's about a 20-year endeavor there, just so you know. It's not a short, not a short thing. Um, so the basic idea um, is if you structure your conversation in a way that you define the demand, figure out what you need to observe and predict, what data you need to do that, figure out how you adapt, what interventions you can take, communicate and understand to the public so they'll take the right action, also to the policy and decision makers, you can actually increase your preparedness and resilience in the middle there. That whole notion is called integrated information systems. I'm not going to go into that, but here is, here is basically the short version of that. Define demand, enhance your prediction skill, observe, monitor, understand, communicate the health actions whether for heat, it's an action plan, and then take the action and then learn from it and start over again. So I put a few examples up from the um, systems that do exist. So just, you're not starting from scratch. We have some of these for health, not a lot. We have a very robust system for famine early warning. Many of you may already get that information. It's a very big international effort now. Um, this is just one piece of it. If you use net.gov, you can go get all kinds of information there. Roger helped start the National Integrated Drought Information System. This is a US-focused um, slide right here. There is an international piece. So there are networks of people and institutional constructs that exist that help ensure that the systems are in place, that the questions are asked properly, and that there's a sustainability to an endeavor rather than just uh, starting something without a, without a plan. So we have, we have pretty robust systems in place. Each one of these could be an entire talk. So this is just an idea that there are systems already out there. Some of you are already involved in, in many of them, or at least know them. Um, we heard a little bit about heat, so I felt compelled to put this National Integrated Heat Health Information System up there. I'm actually in charge of that. Wasn't going to talk about it, but there was a little discussion of heat. So if anybody's interested in heat in the Pacific, let me know. More importantly, however, and probably more relevant for you, is its international counterpart, the Global Heat Health Information Network. Some of you are on the steering committee for that, and it is designed to help facilitate um, co-learning about heat globally to propel, propel action forward across multiple time scales. So not just during an extreme heat wave, but some of the things we're talking about, heat and drought, heat and wildfires, heat and disease. And it's not just in urban environments, it's outdoor workers, it's construction workers, it's rural rural folks, it's, it's a, a much broader um, construct. So if you're interested in that, we're having our first forum in December in Hong Kong. And then um, I'll skip that and just go right here to the end. Um, one of my favorite scientists still is Einstein. I don't know why, I've always liked him. Maybe it's his hair, maybe it's his mind, I'm not sure. But I think what, one of the reasons we're here and one of the reasons uh, I think Chris asked me to talk about this is that approaching things the way we've been doing it isn't getting us where we need to go. And so part of the task for the rest of this meeting is to figure out how we do things a little bit differently and how we, how we behave differently and how we actually uh, capitalize on the lessons we've all learned. This is just one of many. Um, those are my final points. Seize the moment, learn by doing, structure it, build trust, be creative and patient. It is possible and even fun. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you.